Uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone. W what a terrific turnout. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm Ross Virginia. I direct the Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth College, which is part of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And, and this is r really a great event and a very fun one and special one for the Institute of Arctic Studies. And, and our sister or partner institution, the Stephenson Arctic Institute in Akureyri, Iceland. Um, so you'll learn a little bit about Akureyri, a little bit about Dartmouth. You're going to learn about Stephenson. You're going to learn about Evelyn. Um, and then you're going to hear an amazing lecture from our honored speaker, the Stephenson Memorial Lecture delivered by um, Dr. Hugh Beach. Um, so um, my role here is to give you a little bit of the background and, and history about the relationships between Stephenson, the US, Dartmouth, and Iceland. OK, that's where I'm going to start. And I have to say, um, the, this lecture is, is designed to honor really very distinguished leaders in Arctic research and people that have made a difference to the peoples of the Arctic and our understanding of the Arctic. And uh, Stephenson, um, we'll talk about his legacy. That's really what he did in his day. And it's, a, it's a really an honor to, to recognize Hugh Beach for his career's work. And we'll hear a bit more about that in a few minutes. <coughs> So um, most people at Dartmouth have at least heard the name, Willemer Stephenson. Um, Stephenson um, was a polar explorer, an Arctic explorer, um, a, a very interesting and amazing man, and I encourage you to read about his life. Um, he's of Icelandic descent. He was born in Canada and lived most of his life in the United States. And he really has three different lives and three different histories, depending upon who you ask and, and you know, uh, which nation you're in. But I think everyone agrees that Stephenson made a mark. He led three major expeditions into the Arctic. You can see that it spanned multiple years. He was the last of what we might call the heroic age explorers. He went into the north for multiple years at a time without support of aircraft or radio. So he would just sort of disappear and then reappear and have information and then disappear. Um, and in that process, he was a very prolific writer and communicator. He delivered lectures everywhere. He wrote articles, popular articles, in many, many books. And um, I think this is probably the iconic photo of Stephenson. It's rumored to be his favorite. It's from the book, The Friendly Arctic. And um, in this book, Stephenson outlined his vision of the North, that it was a friendly place, a place that had uh, important cultures, that people that were adapted and resilient to the Arctic conditions, that we had much to learn from them. But more importantly, in certain ways, he, he put the US, uh, he got the US to be thinking about the Arctic as an important place, a place where the future of the US was, the United States was closely tied. And he, he put the Arctic on the global map in many ways. And, and, and he, he was very effective at that. Um, Stevenson started lecturing at Dartmouth in the uh, late 20s, early 30s. He became a fairly frequent visitor to the Hanover Plain to visit the men of Dartmouth um, and inspire them with his heroic tales of, of polar exploration. Um, and um, during that period, he developed a relationship that led to this one. Um, he eventually, in, in the latter part of his career, came to Dartmouth. He founded something called the Northern and Polar Studies Program. And I think at the time, it was the third most popular major at Dartmouth College. That's uh, how charismatic he was as, as a leader and as a person. Um, he also was an amazing collector of books and materials. And, and he amassed a huge personal library, which eventually came with him and was deposited at Dartmouth. And that's grown to be the Stephenson Polar Collection and uh, Stephenson Collection and Polar Exploration. And it is now probably the pre world's premier collection on the history of exploration in the Arctic and many other topics. And scholars come from all over the world to spend time at Dartmouth uh, doing research in the Rahner Library. So it's an amazing gift that he's given to Dartmouth to share with the Arctic world. Um, so he resided in Hanover. Um, he died in Hanover. Um, and um, during the period that he was here, he had a, a young librarian um, that, that worked with him, Evelyn. Evelyn eventually became his wife. And Evelyn herself became a very prominent person in, in, in the Arctic. She wrote books. She was a curator of the collection. She did everything she could to promote sort of Stephenson's view of the friendly Arctic, a place important to all peoples. Um, as you can see, she died at the age of 96. Um, and she left a, a, an endowment, an endowed gift, 
that now links Dartmouth to the Stephenson Arctic Institute in Akure, Iceland, um, with the institute that bears Stephenson's name. And we'll learn a little bit more about that in a second. So Evelyn's responsible for this lecture, for creating this linkage in many ways, um, or sustaining it between Dartmouth and Akure, Iceland. So if, if you uh, are local and you wander through Pine Knoll and you've wondered about that rock sitting out there, that is actually Stephenson's grave. Um, and Evelyn um, is also there too. So I encourage you to visit this very important historic site right here in Hanover um, connected to the history of Stephenson. Um, the, the Stephenson Memorial Lecture was established initially um, um, at, by the Stephenson Arctic Institute in Akure, Iceland. Um, this is, uh, Niels and I were counting up, I think, like the 14th time that it's been held. And in the last several years, uh, Dartmouth has partnered much more closely with, with Akureyri. And this be, is becoming a joint event where we can get together. It's a bit of a reunion, but I think it's a very important way for our institutions to collaborate and operate together. And if you look down that list, you can see this is actually a very distinguished list of academics, of leaders, it includes the president of Iceland, um, um, Andy Revkin from the New York Times. Um, lots of very interesting people have made special contributions to our understanding of the Arctic. And we're very proud to add um, Dr. Hugh Beach at the bottom here, um, who will be delivering today's uh, memorial lecture. So the director of the Stephenson Arctic Institute in Akureyri, uh, Iceland, is a, a good friend and colleague, Dr. Niels Einersen. Um, Niels is a, a social anthropologist, an environmental social scientist. And in directing this very important institute, he has a team of scientists that really look at issues around sustainability in the Arctic, and in particular, the sustainability of small communities that live on the coastal margin. Um, his very direct area of, of expertise is in fisheries management and the environmental impacts of fishing on small communities. So, so Niels uh, brings a passion for the Arctic, a passion for understanding the peoples and the futures of the Arctic, and he really does embody the, 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 the Arctic Institute in, in Iceland. Um, um, before I turn it over to him, as I look out here, there are many friends in the audience. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Ambassador Day Mount, U.S. Ambassador to Iceland, also a Dartmouth alum. He's somewhere in the very back row. Um, on this list of distinguished speakers is Dr. Astrid Ogilvy, who delivered the uh, Stephenson Memorial Lecture in 2007. That's the start of the International Polar Year. Astrid is here, right here in the front row. Um, so thank you for being here, Astrid. It's great to have you. Um, and uh, just so many different friends uh, that are here. So um, I'd like to turn it over to Neil so we can fill us in a little bit about Stephenson and Iceland, and then he'll introduce our honored guest, Dr. Hugh Beach. So to you, Niels. Thank you very much, Ross. This is uh, indeed a special occasion. Um, in fact, uh, a special occasion because of many things, uh, one of them being that uh, I'm an old student of Hugh Beach, and uh, he told me to keep my introduction short. <laughs> and I know better than to disobey, diso disobey uh, Hugh, so this will be short. Um, my name is Niels Einarsson. I'm director of the Stephenson Arctic Institute in Iceland, in Akureyri. Uh, we deal with the human dimension of uh, the circumpolar Arctic, uh, economic development, uh, climate change issues, um, marine resource governance issues, and, uh, and political ecology of northern agriculture. I guess that's the four themes we have. Uh, we do research, but we also do uh, participate internationally in um, interdisciplinary uh, research projects. Uh, we have uh, led two major Arctic Council pro projects, the Arctic uh, Human Development Report number two, one and two. The first one I led with Oren Young, uh, who used to be pro professor here, uh, at Dartmouth and, um, and uh, Ross's predecessor here at the Institute. Um, now, keeping in mind uh, 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 Hugh's uh, warning not to be, not to be long, um, I just want to mention one 
a particular project that we have recently started, uh, which we are leading together with the Nansen Center at the University of Bergen. It's called, uh, the acronym is ARCPATH, Arctic Climate Pr Predictions, um, Pathways to Resilient Sustainable Societies. It's, it's a fairly big project. It's one of the centers of excellence that uh, the Nordic Research Council has awarded significant chunk of uh, taxpayers' money for us to spend the next five years uh, doing research in international collaboration uh, on uh, people and climate, and in particular uh, using whales as sentinels, sentinels for uh, climate change and other, other change. Um, but we're also doing uh, several other things. I just named that project because it's like slightly typical of what the kinds of things that we are doing. Uh, we could, we, 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 we're combining uh, basic research with uh, policy relevance issue, relevant issues that actually matter to the people who live in the Arctic. Now, that brings me to um, uh, Hugh Beach. Um, very much actually like, and I'm not going to give you the lowdown on the extensive and impressive academic career that uh, <laughs> Hugh has had. You can Google that if you want. Uh, but uh, what strikes me as, as interesting with uh, the similarity between Stephenson and Hugh is that obviously, um, they're both Harvard-educated anthropologists, which is uh, significant, I think. Uh, they also, both of them, went for the first time on the research expeditions. The first, first expeditions were funded by the Peabody uh, Museum uh, at Harvard, which is also interesting. And uh, both of them were very committed uh, ethnographers, I, well, are committed ethnographers, and uh, with passion for the people that they were studying, uh, with sophistica sophisticated and detailed descriptions of the lives of these people, and an empathy in all, everything they did. So I think that is, uh, that is something that I, I appreciate, especially with uh, uh, Hugh's work, as well as with uh, Stephenson's. And um, um, uh, they, uh, they also, I know that they also, and that's fairly evident from what they, they have written, both of them, they didn't like mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether that has any significance, but I just happen to, happen to know who does. So, um, the, it, it is a great pleasure to, to have uh, Professor Beach accept our offer to deliver this uh, 2016 memorial uh, lecture. And I am, as always, looking forward to hear what he has to say about this topic, this hot topic, uh, which is a key issue for Arctic inhabitants and resource users throughout the circumpolar region. So I give the floor to Hugh Beach. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if I should speak into this one or am I, can you hear me anyway through this one? Okay. Uh, maybe you can switch that. Yes. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's really an honor to be here. And I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, my hosts uh, here at the Dickey Center and Niels and Ross and Lee and everyone who's uh, helped bring me here. And many uh, thanks to you. And I'm looking forward to this. It's a challenge for me to, to in a way, I've been trying to sum up uh, a lot of the uh, main threads of my, my research in, in doing this. And I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to uh, you know the joke, you have a minute to spare, tell me all you know. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, to go so far in the uh, only uh, 45 minutes or so at my disposal, but I'll do my best, and uh, then we'll have some questions afterwards. 
Uh, I have, uh, as, as Niels was mentioning, a kind of feeling of uh, kinship with uh, Stevenson, uh, knowing that I would be coming here a bit in advance. I've uh, brushed up a little bit about Stevenson. Haven't, uh, he's written so much, I've only been able to scratch the surface. But uh, as uh, Niels mentioned, we're both of Nordic descent. We both studied anthropology at the uh, Peabody Museum. And uh, actually, I was interested to see that uh, uh, my book uh, that was titled Guest of the Sami, which I thought rather methodologically aware and creative at the time, uh, he has a chapter in his one of his early books called Guest of the Eskimos. So he's always been there before me. Uh, most importantly, though, I think uh, Stevenson uh, was a bottom-up doer kind of guy, not an armchair theoretician. Uh, he didn't shoot first and ask questions later. He uh, was more like pursuit first and ask questions. Um, so uh, I feel that uh, we share that basic approach. So for myself, uh, I can say that the, uh, there are two things I think that have uh, dominated my uh, major experiences that have dominated my research interests. And one was a chance encounter with Sami reindeer herders in the Swedish mountains when I was a youngster. And that's what launched me into an anthropological career. And that was thanks to my grandmother, who was of Swedish descent. She took me there when I was 15 or something like that. And uh, the second was an inspirational travel study year around the world during my BA program at Harvard, led by anthropologist and cyberneticist Gregory Bateson. And as a result, my scholarly production has grown from a concentration on Sami culture and livelihoods to embrace comparative aspects of reindeer economies throughout the circumpolar area. This, in turn, has caused me to immerse myself in studies of indigenous rights, ethnicity, and political ecology in general. So I hope that this talk will help illuminate how these topics relate and also maybe lay some of the foundation for a panel discussion, which is uh, scheduled for tomorrow. And I assume, I hope many of you have the chance of attending that. We'll be able to continue, I hope, some of the discussions and points of interest that are being brought up now. Now, what I can offer is, is really a perspective born then of a, what, you know, what I can best do, I think, is to give you the benefit of uh, 40 years of experience in the field among northern indigenous peoples. So it's natural that my focus is on change. What are the determinants of change for Sami reindeer herders? Can we find pattern in these changes? What might analysis of such patterns reveal for more general propositions? So for a start, uh, oddly, I'm going to start with a little uh, eulogy I wrote for a reindeer herding dog uh, when he died. And let me see if I can, oh, here he is. All right, okay, great. Rick was this dog. Now, not so long ago, any Sami reindeer herder would have felt ill-equipped without a lasso, knife, and dog. When a herder sought a job as hired herding apprentice, a prospective employer would look at the herder's dog in action more than at the herder. If the dog was good, then the herder must also be good. Nonetheless, I did not appreciate the link between herder and dog sufficiently until I got to know Rick and his human, Henrik. Rick was the most outstanding herding dog I have ever encountered. I recall vividly a spring migration in the mid-1970s when I was stationed on skis on the left flank to hold one edge of a fast and eager herd. The reindeer flow, scatter, and congeal over the white snowy landscape like a drop of liquid mercury, and I had to shout and move ahead quickly to cut off and turn any attempts of small flocks to break away and run beyond our control. By drawing me off too far to one side and turning, suddenly the deer could throw me off balance, and I would find myself ill-positioned to head off their escape. 
But time after time, Rick would appear out of nowhere, right at the critical juncture, a black ball of energy curbing them back midstream. Henrik rarely had to speak to him. It was enough for him to look or to point with his nose in a certain direction, and Rick would set off in a flash. Most of the time, Rick would read the herder's quixotic moods himself and know what to do. At this job, he was worth five herders, and it was evident that he took pride in his work. In this, Rick had assumed not only his human skills, but also his unpretentiousness, confidence, and authority. Once in a freezing and blurry snow wind, I saw Rick shoot off to turn some runaways that had come too far from our reach. It looked hopeless. And finally, Henrik called him back. I noticed the fleeting reflex when Rick heard but decided to pretend not to hear. He continued to chase out of sight and was gone all night. Henrik was in a black mood, said little to anyone, and instead kept busy that evening cutting up an old hide. In the morning light, Rick straggled back with an equally haggard flock of deer. They had not been able to shake him off. Henrik scolded Rick for disobeying and then fed him, fed him lovingly and with small leather socks made from the pieces of hide he had cut, bound up his paws, which were bleeding badly from ice cuts. Now, what if we look at just that little scenario, what has changed since then? Seen through the small window offered by that illustration. In Sweden, herd herders often don't have good reindeer dogs anymore. They might have dogs as barking machines. I mean, a deer will run from a barking machine. Or for hunting or guarding homes, perhaps. But they are not trained to be able to do what a dog, a herding dog, should do. They can't follow either voice commands, maybe, or, or hand signals. There are some, but few. And an unskilled dog is far worse than none at all in herding operations. Herders are their own masters and hardly take jobs as hired hands. That's something that is not possible, really, in the Swedish system anymore. Uh, legal system, voting system, taxation system, you, you don't just move around taking a job like that anymore. The actual driving of reindeer on migration during snow cover is commonly done by snowmobile. During the bare ground period, the gathering of a herd and corralling is often done by helicopter, ironically termed flying dogs. As usual in these kind of changes, what starts as a comfortable aid ends as a necessity as anyone with a computer has experienced and bewailed. Take, for example, the snowmobile. The first man that got a snowmobile, wow, I can get to all these different, everyone else has to be on skis, it takes some days to get there, I can go home in between the different herd divisions, sleep at home and rush off to the next one, don't lose any time, and that's great. He had a, it was fine, but next thing you know, uh, <clears throat> other herders start saying, wow, that's, Pretty good idea, I'm gonna get a snowmobile too. And once a few, a lot of people got a snowmobile, then the corralings were no longer scheduled once a week, they were scheduled every day because everyone could get there. And before you know it, if you, didn't, if you don't have a snowmobile, you're dead as a herder because you can't get to the corrals in time. So this is the typical kind of development that's always happening. Same with helicopter use. The helicopter now not only fly out herders to position them, <clears throat> they're also flying out families and to, instead of migrating in the same way. 
and they're being used in, uh, for transport and like flying dogs. Now to grasp what can be seen through a larger window of change, it is necessary to grasp some basics of Swedish Sami herding regulations and indigenous rights. I'm afraid I'm just going to have to do a little quick blitz of certain very basic things to so get the gist of what they're up against, how the system works. <coughs> Immemorial right to land. Originally, immemorial right, according to Swedish law, was based on a non-ethnic concept. You had the right as long as you or no one knew how long your forefathers first came to that area. You're there, and no one even can remember how they got there. Then you had immemorial right. And your immemorial right was to use the land and to, to continue to live on the land and live off the land as you always have. It was non-ethnic, as I said, so that even not so long ago, Swedish people, non-Sami Swedes, could invoke immemorial right to have fishing rights in the Swedish archipelago. Herding rights now are all that remain for special Sami resource use. And in practice, all those in practice, it's so that all those of Sami ancestry have the right. But the, 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 uh, the, the whispered phrase behind that scene is, you might have the right, but you don't have the right to practice the right unless you're a reindeer herder. So you have a distinction in Sweden between the Sami who are reindeer herders and the Sami who are not reindeer herders. All of, you, all, all of Sami ancestry have the right to herd, but only those who exist in the Sami bees have the right to practice their right. And let me, if I can, uh, this is just to show you now the Swedish Sami bees. Uh, I don't know, each one of these, they're numbered here. There are about 50 of them. Many of them are running this way, up to the Norwegian border. The summer lands up here, and then they migrate down to the lowlands. Here's the mountain range between Norway and Sweden. That's the summer range. And then you move down to the winter range. And there are about 50 Sama bees in Sweden. And they note, note that they are not only a territorial unit, they're also a social unit. The herders that herd in that area, they belong to that grazing range. They're not supposed to have their reindeer outside of that range. Of course, the reindeer don't care. They don't know, and they often do stray around. But you got to bring them back. And, and uh, um, each one of those uh, Sama bees has been given a herd size limit called a rational herd size limit based on what the grazing lands are supposedly able to sustain. Now, in Sweden, the idea is that you are granted, it's, it's, it's remarkable to, to compare what is the basis of indigenous rights in different countries. In Sweden, you have now your remaining herding rights are based on the fact that you're supposed to, it's kind of a protective thing. You are to protect your Sami, uh, the, the Sami culture. That's why you have special rights. It's not for any Swede. And what is special about Sami culture, they say? Well, it's reindeer herding. Of course, even in the past, not at all all Sami were reindeer herders, but that's what they're able to identify as somehow special to the Sami. And that's the, the cultural element which they say we're willing to grant special resource rights to, to preserve. Sounds good in a way, but the flip side of that is that to the extent anyone leaves that hurt that special form of resource use, that special form of livelihood, in other words, reindeer herding, to that degree, should they also lose their reindeer herding right? Not lose the right, but the, the right to practice the right, I should say. I mean, the idea is that we're giving you these special, it's, it's been converted from actually from a right to a privilege. 
we're giving you this privilege to, to utilize these grazing lands to preserve your Sami culture. If you start, you know, flying around in helicopters using, uh, uh, you know, GPS senders and all this kind of stuff, uh, is that Sami culture? I mean, any Swede could do that. Why should you have special rights to do that? Well, uh, actually, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, it's a point that must be addressed and should be answered. Well, okay, so the main thing then is that uh, because of this system, a Sami who engages in any other activity, a non-herding activity, can be, in effect, thrown out of the Samabi by the others. The existing membership has the right to throw out someone who engages himself more in his labor, his income earning labor, more than 50% in a non reindeer herding livelihood. So you can't be a, a Sami, uh, as they would say, a herder for more than, uh, it's, it's called by, for short, the 51% rule. If you, if you do something more than 51%, uh, you can be uh, thrown out. Will you be thrown out? That's the interesting question. You will not necessarily be thrown out. It's that the, the Samibi members have the right to throw you out if they so wish. Now when, and this gets us to the interesting point of flexibility in the system. You have a limit here, and as long as the actual herd size is under the limit, then why should there, there's no real pressure on your teammates, your Samabi partners, to throw you out. As a matter of fact, you might be nice to have around because you maybe have a lot of herding knowledge. Maybe you're an old timer who's, you know, kind of uh, divesting his herd in his old age by giving, a, giving them away to his children or something like that. Doesn't mean you don't have a lot of herd knowledge. And uh, your labor can be significant. So, and, and why should family members throw each other out? They don't want to throw each other out if there's not a cause. So as long as your herd size is under the limit, there's no real pressure. But what happens as the herd size approaches that limit? Uh, that's when the going gets rough. That's when the knife comes to the throat. And that's when we have the situation, as the Swedes say, where one's bread is another's dead. In English, I guess you call it the, the zero-sum game or something like uh, equivalent to that. If I have more reindeer, you're gonna have to have less reindeer because there's a maximum limit to the number you can have. If you go over the limit, it's enforced slaughter, which is not good. Okay, so this is just some basic uh, principles. Now what happened in the 60s was that they did a, a study of the health of, of uh, reindeer herders and of, of Sweden population as a whole, it turned out that the reindeer herders in Sweden had so-called vital statistics, which were drastically low, kind of on par with the uh, underdeveloped nations of Africa. And this was a blot on the Swedish uh, welfare system. It did not look good. And Sweden wanted to do something about this. We have to raise the living standard of the reindeer herders. Now, how are we going to do that? I mean, again, we've got limits to the number of reindeer we can have. So that's what the basic first, my, my, my first study was about <coughs> what's called in, 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 in Sweden rationalization. Now, I've, I've said rationalisering, it's in Swedish, but rationalization is a term which somehow just doesn't quite bite in the same way to the English-speaking public. And I think this is why I found this, which is helpful. These are all the, in, in, in the English, you have many, many different concepts of the rationalization or rationalizing or rational. And the one that is to, be, to look at here, it says chiefly British, not so American, I guess. This is the one that we're talking about for the Swedish system to bring modern, efficient methods to, for example, an industry, like the reindeer herding industry. That's the rationalization of it. In other words, 
your, your flexibility is uptight, and we can go into like, like what, what happened with rapid climatic change, among other things, but we'll, I hope we'll have time to come to that, but we might not. Uh, I hope so. Anyway, an uptight system, what are you going to do about it? And the two-pronged method they, they figured on doing was called structural rationalization and production rationalization. Structural rationalization is very simple. If you have a, a piece of pie and you've got to divide it by, uh, you know, everyone, there are 100 people are going to eat this pie, then they're all going to have a little slice. And that little slice might be, be below the poverty limit. So what are we going to do? We're just going to get rid of some of those mouths and everybody should have uh, maybe half a piece of pie, everybody being two herders left instead of 100. So get rid of a huge portion of herders, that's structural, structural rationalization, and those that remain uh, can divvy the cake and have more to go around. Of course, the law said, how are we going to do that? You can read, it's fascinating to read the debates in Parliament about how they decided to do this. It says right out, we cannot apply a simple Soviet system where we're just going to you know, collectivize it all and throw half of them out or, and, and move them around as we please. No, we have to do this in a, in a more you know, democratic system. That's why you have devised this system of them. It's supposed to be a self-rationalizing some be a self-rationalizing unit. As the going gets rough, as the knife approaches the throat, as you begin to approach the limit to your grazing, then you, you gotta throw your uncle out and your father and your brother in, but not before. Uh, so uh, that's structural rationalization. That's one part of the winning of flexibility. Now what's the other part? The other part is called production rationalization. Production rationalization is just how do we get the most out of a reindeer? How do we increase profits from reindeer? Well, the things we can do are, for example, selective breeding, get those big, fat, good, you know, tasting reindeer which are gonna produce more meat, age sex composition of the reindeer herd, calf slaughter, those things go together, age sex composition, and calf slaughter. Why calf slaughter? It's all based on a very common principle that almost everybody kind of encounters sooner or later. It's not just in reindeer herding, it's in almost most forms of production uh, based on uh, growth intensity, it's called. Even those that produce timber uh, deal with growth intensity. Things that are young grow faster than when they're old. And if, you're, if you've got a lot of forest land out there, it's foolish to let those trees grow to be 1,000 years old before you cut them, assuming you're still around. Uh, it's much better to let them grow maybe 50 years and cut, and 50 years again and cut, and 50 years again. In 1,000 years, you're going to produce a lot more timber that way than if you just let the same trees grow around until they're 1,000 years old. In the same way with reindeer. A reindeer calf is growing a lot faster than an older reindeer. The interesting point is you always have to say, which they conveniently often forget, per unit grazing consumed. That's the, the essential thing you have to remember. Per unit reindeer grazing consumed, the calf will be producing more meat. So according to the ag school, the agricultural schools, in Sweden, they pointed out, they even got it uh, so that the larger, I mean, traditionally, the Sami would generally want to have a big reindeer to slaughter. Big reindeer gives me more meat. Fine. Well, they, oh, they said, no, you are poor traditional herders who don't know your own good. Uh, it's far better to have calf slaughter and we're going to really push for and introduce, we're going to force you, we're going to make you get that living standard up. So we're really going to, with all possible means, induce you to go over to calf slaughter. So they would start paying subsidies, extra money if you slaughtered a calf, and things like this, you know, in every possible way to get you to flip over to calf slaughter. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at it, it again, same system applies. And they were always saying that the herders that were resisting this, they're not gonna do it. 
oh, these poor herders, they don't know really what they're doing, foolish herders, they're traditionalists. Well, you know, so many people aren't very well schooled after all. Well, if you really look at it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, if the grazing limit is here and your herd size is actually down here, it doesn't matter if you're going to save. Uh, it's, it's unused grazing anyway. You might as well let that reindeer grow a bit more. You don't have to slaughter them. There's no pressure for you to apply calf slaughter at that stage. Let them grow up till they're bigger. Let them grow full grown if you've got the grazing. It's only as you hit the, again, knife at the throat, as the limits of flexibility decline, it's only then that calf slaughter is going to be at least in, on the table as a possible importance. There are other things that will be pushing towards calf slaughter. If you have high predation in the, in the wintertime, uh, it might be wise for you to slaughter before the wolf's going to get them, something like that. But, but that's another scenario. I'm just talking about the basic paradigm of production rationalization here. It doesn't make sense to do calf slaughter unless you're up at the wire, pretty much, most of the time. And the other thing point is that they forget is what happens uh, when you hit the wire because of the other part of the system. Remember, you, you throw each other out. I mean, I forgot to say that reindeer are privately owned. In, in, uh, some people have a lot of reindeer. Some people don't have so many reindeer. Some people are rich. Some people are poor. So <clears throat> if, if you're... Uh, If you're under the limit, all, all can be, you know, you can let the little guy, let the little guy be away. But your, your voting rights, how you kick each other out, is again by Swedish law based on your reindeer possessions. It's like the Swedish, the, the Swedish system has been pasted over the Sami traditional system so that you, you have to buy it kit and caboodle. You, uh, a Samabi works now like a Swedish corporation, and the reindeer are like stocks. It's like stock, like the stock market, not just animal stock. Your voting rights in the Samabi is based on how many reindeer you have, on the same basic principle. If you own a million shares in IBM stock, you should have more to say in that company than if you own only 10 shares. In the same way, in your Samabi area, if you have a 1,000 reindeer, you should have a lot more to say than if you only have 10 reindeer. You've got more voting power in it, you see. So what happens as you begin to reach the ceiling? Actually, for calf slaughter to work, it has to be kind of an all or nothing proposition. If some people in the Samabi start doing calf slaughter and others don't, well, then, then any grazing you save will just be eaten up by my reindeer. It doesn't do you any good at all. I mean, why should I save for you? So everybody's got to be in on the team to do it. But what happens as you hit, as you begin to hit that limit? That's when the di divisions of divisiveness and, and conflicts erupt madly because of the power of politics game and the ability to try to throw each other out. That's when they're going to start throwing each other out and things like this. So um, to have a unified policy at that stage of the game, it becomes almost impossible to do. Uh, the rationalization program uh, was a largely a, a failure in any Samabi that had any flexibility left in it. It would just not be applied. And it makes sense that it would not be applied. It's only in the Samabis where you're hitting the maximum limit for a long enough period of time where the knife forces you into it. You're forced to throw out the so-called hobby herders. Hobby herders are those that are just in it because they love the lifestyle, but they're not making much of a livelihood doing it. And maybe they're herding reindeer because they get certain hunting and fishing privileges on the side as, a, as an extra part of that. Okay, uh, hmm. uh, I've gone into detail a bit, rather probably, probably overly much into detail about that because 
Rationalization to me is a very, very important concept to have in any ecological toolkit kind of. We always talk about sustainability of things, the sustainability of that, and we even talk about loose about sustainable development, which is like you know sustainable acceleration somehow. Um, but so so what? How does rationalization fit into these concepts of sustainability? First of all, we have to realize that rationalization is almost always invoked in order for to help sustainability. It's the herders were having a bad standard of living. We want to help them have a better life. We want to have a more sustainable reindeer herding. <clears throat> so we want to rationalize it. We want to make it better, more productive. But what does that do? What rationalization does, it's what's different between rationalization and sustainability. First of all, sustainable is if we draw a limit here of this is our, this is the limit of our resource. Anything below that limit is going to be sustainable. Um, but that's not what rationalization is. Rationalization says not only are you not to, could you, should you be under it, of course you can't be over it because that's not <laughs> rational. Not only <clears throat> can, do you have to be under it, but you have to be right there at that point. The maximization of your resources. Wastage is not rational. That's the key issue here. Wastage is not rational. It's lost grazing. It's lost income. It's lost reindeer meat. It's lost income for the herders. The issue, though, is that we are dealing with what, what I would call nested hierarchies of relationship. We have the relationship between grazing as a resource, reindeer as a consumer of that resource. We also have the relationship of reindeer as a resource and reindeer herders as consumers of that resource. And we also have the relationship of the number of reindeer herders as a resource and the strength and political clout of their cultural rights and minority position as kind of what you could call a consumer of that. In other words, if that fails, if all the herders are wiped out, Sami rights <laughs> dwindle into practically nothing and the Sami ability to maintain their rights in particular culture just dwindles drastically. Um, <clears throat> I can show you, let me see just quickly if I can represent graphically the issue. Uh, here it is. Um, what's called the subsistence minimum, that's to, to what you really need to have a decent li livelihood. The number of herders is the, the line along the bottom, and the number of reindeer is the... the y-axis. <clears throat> so the area within this triangle is the total number of reindeer in that Samabi, in that area. Notice, however, that I've averaged it out. Remember I said earlier that reindeer herding is privately owned, so it's not at all a flat graph like that. You have some of the lot and some of the few. I'm doing an average here. This is an average. What RNL, that means the reindeer law, that's the Swedish reindeer law, which was created and applied in 1971. When I first came over there, the law was fresh. That's when they were pushing through the rationalization paradigm to increase. The idea is you, you turn this in effect so that you, you, you're each, each, remember, structural rationalization. You get that, that up on its edge. Oops, this is not working anymore. Sorry. Anyway, you get that up on its edge, <clears throat> and suddenly everybody is over the subsistence minimum. Um, but the system, the, the real runaways in the system have not been controlled at all. Why is it so that the number of reindeer a reindeer herding family needs each year to maintain the same living standard keeps rising? In the past, maybe you needed only 100 reindeer, you'd have a good life. Now you need 500 reindeer to have a, a decent life. And in my time, it's gone up, 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 up. 
what is, it's, it's not, in other words, if you keep applying this system, you're going to get what I call over there the graph of possible future one. Now, the area <coughs> in that column of possible future one is the same as the area. In other words, the same number of reindeer, you're, in, you're still within the sustainable limits of the, of the reindeer range, but you're up there at the, at the, with a lot of reindeer owned by a very, very few herders. That is the scenario, and uh, this is, of course, what the herders would prefer, uh, a much lower subsistence minimum, a much broader number of herders. Um, that's what they would prefer. All right. Um, my gosh, time is running out. I'm going to have to jump uh, way ahead. Now, we've, we've talked about problems. Uh, I should talk about, you know, we talk about why rationalization is sometimes applicable and why at other times it's not and why it, it sometimes just doesn't work at all, even though people would like it to work. Uh, what does it do? What are the problems, the problems with the solution? If that, for example, if the winter is bad, the, 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 little, the, the little calves that have been particularly bred to be fat and uh, uh, producing a lot of meat quickly, they're often the first to go. It's, often, it's usually the scrawny little guy who doesn't need much food and never did need much food, he's going to make it through the winter. Um, in other words, what you do with through rationalization is it's in effect you're controlling, you're trying to con you control, you demand the control of more and more variables. You in effect bring reindeer herding more into the barnyard. You start saying, oh, it would also be rational to even out the tops and valleys of the grazing cycle, you know, winter Lands might be the bottleneck of your grazing cycle. You might have a lot of grazing in the summer, but if you don't have much winter grazing, then you're not going to have that many reindeer. But if we complement the winter grazing with artificial fodder, then we're able to bring it over that slump period. So, so we're going to start with artificial fodder, too. That's also more rational. It might cost some for the fodder, but then again, the plus, the gains you will make in the meat production are going to be better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Gradually, more and more and more. You reduce the flexibility of the system. You bring that. You want to get there, right there. Maximized, but hardly any flexibility left. Bad winter, you're gone, pretty much. OK. There are other examples I can give. I'm going to have to go faster. Oh. Typical thing, too, if you're going over to calf slaughter, that means you're, you're, you're slaughtering out all the old males before they even get old. I mean, they're not even getting old. All you need is to have enough for, for being stud reindeer, just to impregnate enough of you. One, one, one stud reindeer can impregnate countless numbers of females, and uh, it's not gonna, they're not going to live to be very old. The knowledge that it's not only old Herders have knowledge. Old reindeer have a lot of knowledge. Having old reindeer in the herd really calms it down. They are often the lead reindeer. They make herding much simpler. They're the ones that know the route. Nowadays, the calves are being slaughtered before they even know the, the route, the migration route. Um, the, and so they're being trucked. Now they get trucked in big trucks. Instead of migrating, uh, they're often trucked. Uh, again, when, in, in other words, again, the flexibility, the system, ha, it has repercussions upon repercussions upon repercussions. And I shouldn't go in. Okay. But um, time, oh my gosh. I was going to get into the, there's a current big debate about uh, 
resilience theory as opposed to uh, political ecology. And I'm not, I'm going to have to cut most of that and try to sum up here. If I can, these kinds of issues that we're talking about, about rationalization, do not only apply to the reindeer herding itself. They apply to almost all facets of what happens as a traditional society gets challenged by <coughs> pressures to reduce flexibility. And one of those is, for example, rapid climatic change. And um, we have erupting battles of framing. In other words, what is the moral high ground? We see in the Swedish press constantly uh, notices that Reindeer herding is eroding, quote, the Swedish mountains. That makes uh, Sami furious. Uh, not only because it's called Swedish mountains, but from their perspective, of course, they've been colonized, their lands have been taken over, their reindeer have been thrown off range after range after range. It's as if you take all the animals in the world, in, in the area, and confine them in a tiny little pen and then you look at them running around in that pen, and you look down there and you say, oh, that grass is totally ruined, it's been trampled. The reindeer are eroding the Swedish landscape. Uh, this is what you, you, know, you constantly hear. So um, they, they, uh, another example is the wolf, environmentalists. I mean, the wolves, of course, are not particularly nice uh, for reindeer herders. Reindeer herders do not have an instinctive love of wolves. But what is commonly now seen in the press is that, oh, these, uh, the reason the Sami people are so against the wolf is because they've been bred on stories of Little Red Riding Hood, and they've just got this kind of uh, uh, psychological childhood Hatred, it's just hatred of, of the wolf, and uh, we have to do something, and, and they should not, we have to protect the wolf uh, against these uh, savage uh, idiots who have just been ruined by Little Red Riding Hood stories. But let's face it, why, it's pretty obvious to understand why reindeer herders don't like wolves. But most herders you talk to, they're not frantically hateful against wolves, they just feel rather understandably that if the Swedish society decides that it wants to have a viable wolf population, then the Swedish society should be willing to share the costs of that, and not only the Sami people. And then they say, then the argument, yes, but we pay compensation for, the, uh, for having these wolves. Well, what happens is this. Uh, a reindeer herder might lose all his animals to the wolf, and then, uh, in the old, when I first came to Sweden, there was supposedly only one wolf left in Sweden. And you were not allowed to hunt that wolf. The wolf was hunted, uh, you got money to shoot a wolf over there in Russia, but again, through a kind of a, a scientific renaming of the thing, the, the wolf became a Scandinavian wolf. And the Scandinavian wolf is different from the Russian wolf and we have to preserve the endangered Scandinavian wolf, even if we were gonna shoot off the Russian wolf. But then they found out that the Scandinavian wolf uh, is really, the wolf population in Scandinavia is bred by only two or three wolf couples and therefore has a very bad uh, genetic composition. And uh, the only way it turned out to save the Scandinavian wolf is to import wolves from Russia. Uh, then they become the Scandinavian well, still somehow. Um, but the main thing is that if, if a wolf herders, if, if a wolf is, the wolf is now by law entirely protected. A herder that shoots or in any way even 
skis after a wolf uh, to try to protect his reindeer will be put in jail. Uh, if you kill a wolf in Sweden, the, the, it's almost worse than the jail sentence you get if you shoot a human being. You're put in jail for a long time and heavily fined. Uh, but you get the herd, then they say you get compensation. But what happens is that if, for example, if, if there's a bad winter and the, ca and the cows in, in the southern part of Sweden are dying and the, and the government goes in and buys uh, fodder from the farmer to feed the cows, then it's considered compensation and you know, subsidy to the cow industry. We're helping the cows to, to give them food over this bad winter. But if, if the reindeer are being taken to feed the wolves, because you're not allowed, not to, you're not allowed to stop the, the wolf from eating the reindeer, that's still considered, and then the herder gets some money, that's considered subsidy to the reindeer industry. Um, to me, it should be looked a little bit the other way. Historically, I can see why that might be so. When the reindeer was an act of nature catastrophe, but now the reindeer is not a natural catastrophe. Now the reindeer is a managed animal with, with a law that says you cannot hunt it. It's not a subsidy to the reindeer industry. It's a subsidy to wolf herding. That's what it is now. But they don't want to look at it that way because the wolf, after all, is supposed to be a wild animal. We have to start questioning when, what, what is nature and what is wild in this situation. The wolf might not know it, but it's becoming more and more domesticated because it's being totally underprotected under a legal system. Um, Sure, the reindeer herders are getting paid, but that's like paying the farmer for his crops. That's not, when the farmer gets, gives crops to the cows, he's not getting a farmer's subsidy. It's the, re, it's, the, it's the farmer with the cows that's getting the subsidy. But the Swedish government, for example, does not agree with that. And there was a recent, not so long ago, a, a, a big publication that came out, the, the title, a government investigation entitled, What Does a Reindeer Cost? And they counted up a lot of money, and it turned out that the reindeer cost 175% of its produce. In other words, the reindeer cost the government 175% of what the reindeer industry actually produces. In other words, it's a totally subsidized kind of a hobby uh, uh, business just to help supposedly indigenous people, you know, giving them handouts by the Swedish welfare state. That's what it's come down to. But if you look at those figures, where do they count those 175%? Uh, percent? Most of it is what they call subsidies to the reindeer industry for predator compensation. Predator compensation, which is demanded of them, it's just payment for their food. They don't count it as a subsidy to the predator business or the predator industry or the wolf uh, hurting business. And what does that do? In other words, these, these battles, these, these conceptual ways of looking at things as the, as the wolf goes from being a natural disaster to becoming a legislated disaster changes things drastically. And nowadays, uh, it's like for the Swedish majority population, that's like waving a red flag in front of an angry bull. Sami are costing you all this. Taxpayers, this is what you have to pay to keep these Sami. And of course, the people, other people in the North would say, hey, I've been living up here for years, generations. And can I drive snowmobiles in the national parks? Do I have the right to make a fire here? Can I live the way the Sami do up in their mountains and run around having a good time getting subsidies for their reindeer? Uh, no. You know, we... A minority, indigenous minority, is entirely in a democratic system, and certainly more even in a dictatorial system, in a democratic system, very much in the hands of the ambient majority voting population. Their ability to, do, to exist 
it all is totally predicated on the empathy and goodwill of the majority population. When you start coming around saying you guys are just 175 percent uh, uh, drain on us taxpayers, uh, it does. It's uh, it's a uh, falsification, which uh, it's in battlement. Uh, it's a political construct. That's why. If you, I, I, I know I'm going over time. I'm sorry, uh, and there's so much more I wanted to say, but let me just kind of end this way by saying, um, if you ask a ranger herder today anything about climate change or something like that, they'll say, "Sure, maybe there's some climate change," but if you want to talk about the things that really matter to us, the things that are important to us, the things that are totally determinant to us, it's legislation, it's politics. It's the media which is skewering us uh, and giving us uh, you know, false messages and uh, unjust treatment, most of all. That, that's what the real issue is. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm, there's much more uh, to go here. Um, I suppose I should be uh, asking for questions, which I will immediately try to turn around into something I wanted to say. <laughs> but but well, that's, um, that's a wonderful skill to have. So I, I have a So Hugh, I want to thank you for demystifying to some extent the provision I think that many people have about indigenous people living on the land, if you will. Um, I was in Washington this week, and the Minister of Public Council was talking about these very same issues. The top issue is the climate change and self-determination, right? And so it's seen in different ways in different places, but I really uh, appreciate your perspectives here. So uh, time for comments or questions. And we have a microphone oh, that we can pass to you. I should have been using it. Um, Yeah, I had a question uh, for you. What impact did Chernobyl have on the Sami reindeer herds? I heard there was a Becquerel Express that would bring meat down once a week or something to Uppsala for analysis. Uh, how long, what effect did it have and how long did it last and does it still persist? Uh, you, you've hit upon a... Uh topic which is one that I have an ongoing uh, project with for the last uh, 30 years and uh, it's going to be difficult uh, for me to sum up but if you give me just a minute I will find you uh, the appropriate figures here it still persists there are hard hit areas and there are less hard hit areas but as I've said before the impact is far greater uh, and more meaningful than just the Becquerel counts of the CZ-137. It's the politics of it. And in Sweden, it's all been just a, a kind of a scientific game that is very difficult to figure out. I can start out by saying, even before I get to my... my oh, I, have a, I had a section here called Becquerel Battles, <laughs> the Chernobyl case. There are also parallel, close parallels between what happened in Sweden following upon the Chernobyl disaster of 1986 and what we encounter today with rapid climatic change. While both are very real, they are also subject to dramatically variable perceptions and interpretations, making politics out of what <coughs> is to be considered nature or natural enough. Swedish Sami herders might never have known about the effects of Chernobyl or been made to feel them had it not been for the scientists who informed them, tested their reindeer meat, and read values off of strange instruments. In the first slaughter season after Chernobyl, reindeer meat was to be confiscated in Sweden if it held cesium-137 at a concentration above 300 becquerels a kilo, while in Norway, at the same time, the confiscation threshold value was 6,000 becquerels a kilo. What does either value really mean with respect to human health? 
And in the field, you would get all kinds of, no one really knew anything, so it was interesting to talk to people. Some would say, well, eating meat that's about uh, uh, over uh, 300 becquerels a kilo is like uh, smoking a cigarette. Well, what does that really tell you so much? I mean, you know that you, all you know is you know that 600 becquerels is twice as bad as 300 becquerels, supposedly. So it's scaled kind of. I say it's scaled, but it's not really calibrated. Uh, so another, the best what I found was have eating reindeer meat over 300 becquerels a kilo is like being a 62-year-old for a minute. <laughs> what does either value really mean? The following year, Sweden raised the markability level for reindeer meat to 1,500 becquerels a kilo. Why did they do that? Guess why? Because they were subsidizing the loss of the reindeer meat, and it got so expensive because yeah. when it was at 300 becquerels a kilo, the entire country's reindeer had to be dug down in a pit and, and cost money. And then they said, oh, we can't afford this anymore. Oh, we'll just, if, what, what price do we have, what level of becquerels do we have to, to have to kind of get away with the least? <laughs> the least? Well, 1,500, okay, that'll, that cleared up about 90% of the country. It's only about 10% that was producing meat over 1,500. But even so, herders who had meat in the freezer from the slaughter season before Chernobyl submitted that for testing too and found that it was already above the 300 becquerel kilo limit <laughs> due to the atmospheric nuclear bomb tests in the Soviet Union during the 1950s. How long had global warming been going on before we became at least somewhat aware of its impact? Where, would, where should we position the thermostat of our worries? I mean, some uh, groups want, you know, claim the right to be cold. Other groups, in a lot, you know, for example, in Greenland, they, don't, they, they kind of appreciate it getting warm a little bit more because it helps the mining industry a little bit more in, in, in Greenland. So, I mean, we, we sometimes in my household, we have battles of where we want to put the thermostat. Some of my kids think, oh, your dad likes it a little too cold, you know. I'd like to raise it up a bit. Well, okay, we've got global warming, so, what, or, so, so we want to chill it down maybe a bit. So everyone agreed on where we want to be? I don't think so. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, real trouble. Again, political, it's, again, it just demonstrates the, the political aspects of this, as, as is the politics of rapid climatic change. Um, I could just... Uh... All right. Question? Yeah. Thank you. What do the local people you're working with say is their vision for what's sustainable, economically, but also socially and environmentally? Yeah, what their vision is. What they would like to see as sustainable. What, what they feel is sustainable. What they see as sustainable from, from their heritage. They basically, I, I, that's a hard question to get a grip on, I think. I think they, they basically want to be able to live at home, and bring up their children at home and continue at home as a viable lifestyle. Uh, then I think most of them think that that is within reach if only the Swedish government were to be more sensitive to their situation. And not only the Swedish government, because they're notoriously uh, turning a blind eye uh, to the Sami situation. Uh, the Swedes, uh, unfortunately, have a lot of uh, skeletons in the closet when it comes to the uh, treatment of the Sami. And the world, at the same time, likes having a country like Sweden to be kind of Mr. Clean, to go in and, and uh, you know, get the Hans Blix in there and the other people to go in and do, do a kind of liberal and enlightening uh, positions and look at other countries. 
Um, so, and, and other countries also have many skeletons in their closets, so they're not going to throw a lot of stones. So it's very, very difficult to get something brought up into an international court. And that's probably what it's going to take in Sweden. But there's a law, of course, as you know, to get something into the international court, you have to first exhaust your national legal means. And um, that is a hugely expensive proposition. Um, so, you know, getting there is, is entirely difficult. I'm afraid I've, I've dodged your question, I guess. Um, question on the far side of the room, if you ever are a runner. So There's another one over there. Questions over there on the other side? Anyone there? Sure. Sorry. 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 So prior to this modern era of top-down Swedish governmental regulation of their, their reindeer herds, um, was there any community-based governance system in place for, for these indigenous peoples? And could that provide a model moving forward? Yes and no. Um, the Sami, in anthropological terms, have always been known as uh, what's known as a, an acephalous society, a society without a head. You know, it hasn't been one with a strict <coughs> hierarchy. To get a kind of a grasp of how s traditional Sami herding mechanisms worked, uh, I would recommend the work of Robert Payne, uh, who was able to put that together for northern Norway and, because he was doing field work there in the 60s. Uh, by the time I hit Sweden, uh, with the rationalization program, it was heavily dominated. Of course, you can go with, with state uh, legislation and, and ordinances and regulations. Um, you can go back, of course I did, went back as far as I could, and you could see that, no, it was pretty much um, um, the school of hard knocks. I mean, the, the Swedes, I mean, the, the Sami are always saying, um, we, we in the Samabi, why should the government tell us who we can bring in as members or not, or, or the system that we should have? Why should, there be, why should it be based on the limit? Why should the Swedish government say that we have to have our membership formed by the limitations of the grazing lands? I mean, if I want, take here in Dartmouth, if I want to open a barber shop here in Dartmouth, would I have to go around and, and, and see how many other barber shops there are? and be denied the right to open a barbershop just because there are five other barbershops around? Probably I'd be able to open a, bar a barbershop and it would be the school of hard knocks which would decide which barbershop was gonna make it or not, you know? Com competition, it's based largely on, the system was back then based on competition. Now though, it's the, the Swedish government who decides. Uh, who are they going to let in and who are they going to decide? The right of, of free establishment, in other words, has denied the Sami in their reindeer herding operations. And the one leads to the other. And it's all largely based on kind of ecological, these ecological principles, which is very patronizing. It says, we know, we know best. A Sami bee is not allowed to engage in any economic activity other than reindeer herding. Mm. There was a time when one of the Sama bees got a lot of money through hydroelectric power dam, built a huge dam, and they got compensated for that. And they suddenly got all this money. What are we going to do with this money? Well, they were smart and they bought Norwegian stock in oil. And, whew, you know, Norwegian oil took off, and the Sama bee was doing well. Government came in, took the money, and fined them for it because you're not allowed to, get, to have any other economic activity other than reading herding. Why? Because that's why you have your special rights. You shouldn't be having special rights in order to, to go off and, and, and uh, you know, have a, invest in the oil company. Contrast that with the system of the, of that's in Alaska, for example, the Alaska Lady Clean Settlement Act. These different regional corporations, they have oil mines themselves. They have jade farms. They have reindeer herding kind of as a side operation too. They own stocks in IBM and McDonald's hamburgers. They can, they can do whatever they want with their money. 
it's 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 open and free. But the Swedes have this very, you know, set system. Of course, there 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 are minuses with the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act too. You know, you had the so-called uh, uh, termination of exclusivity clause. It was a once and for all settlement. Whereas in Sweden, this is supposed to be going on in perpetuity. You you uh, yeah. Sorry. Exactly one more question, I think. Uh, just, just a quick one. It's nice to know that the Swedish government is similar to the way our government works. Is, is there any uh, economic uh, benefit to tourism up in this area, exploration of the Sami culture? You can repeat the question. Yes, uh, the question was uh, if tourism is uh, in any way. Um, and Im impacting and, and used by, among Sami, is, is, am I correct, in, in the north up there? And uh, yes and no again, because the Sami, as I said, can engage in no other economic activity, then they can't really have a tourist business in the Sami. But they cleverly sometimes, the same herders will, will form a, a so-called economic society, which is supposedly outside of the Samavi and not necessarily using the, the resources uh, and, and therefore able to have some kind of a business. But they have to be very, very careful about being called on that because if they can show, if, the, if, comp, if a competing tourism business run by Swedes can show that you're taking advantage of your special reindeer herding rights of being able to drive the, your tourists by snowmobiles into the national park regions, which somebody else wouldn't be able to do because they're not Sami herders, you're gonna be in deep trouble. So uh, there's that issue. But nowadays they're letting it more and more, uh, let's say look between the fingers a little bit about things like that. So some of this does exist. Indeed, and some Sami have been taking courses in, in uh, tourism uh, uh, training to become tourist training guides. Uh, but the, 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 the sad thing, <laughs> a little bit ironic, is that some of the tourists that come up there, that's the last thing they want. They don't want to, they do not, they avoid the trip uh, by the trained Sami tourist guide. They instead want to have their trip with a real Sami herder who's not just a guy who's gone to school as a tourist. No, 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 we want the real thing. So uh, it's a tricky, tricky thing. Yeah. I think we're about uh, time here, but I, I was um, reflecting back on Stevenson and the friendly arc. And I think if actually read his, his, his words, um, he also talks about the complicated Arctic and the important Arctic and a place that we all want to learn more about. And I want to thank you uh, for providing this very interesting picture of the complexities of Sami and Sweden and indigenous rights and, and just the, the way that we in the South look at these systems. I think we've learned an awful lot and we appreciate your comments and your talk. Thank you very much, Hugh.